For music icon Shania Twain, songs like That Don't Impress Me Much. That Don't Impress Me Much. You're Still the One. Still the one and Man, I Feel Like a Woman. Man, I Feel Like a Woman. Catapulted her into musical icon status. She became the top selling female country music artist in history. But behind the music is the ultimate story of survival. After a battle with Lyme disease, Shania came close to losing the very thing that kept her alive, her voice. The Shania you'll meet today has experienced a rebirth, more confident, more at peace, and with more agency in her own life. This Shania is free. The Shania who sits across from me today is open, honest, and unapologetic. You are in a beautiful chapter in your life. I feel like you're com comfy in your own skin. How do you feel at this age, this stage, where you are right now? I'm feeling quite liberated <laughs> in so many ways. I'm feeling positive and optimistic, mm -hmm. but still at the same time, very unapologetic. Mm, that's a good word. You know what I mean? I, yeah. don't, I don't feel like I need to explain myself as much as probably ever in my life. Mm -hmm. But I feel very responsible still, you know, like sure. the Queen of Me title for the new album. It couldn't be more fitting for where I'm really at in my own mind. I'm responsible for myself. I take the good with the bad. Mm -hmm. I know I've got faults. I know I'll never be perfect. And I'll keep striving to be better, but I'm mostly enjoying the, the search. Yeah. I'm enjoying the, 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 the evolution. They say there's that saying, if you're not learning, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're dying. And I feel like through all these chapters in your life, you're always evolving. Because some people are, are very similar, I feel like, year to year to year. But I don't feel like that's you at all. I feel like I'm an explorer at heart. Yeah. You know, I like to explore um, things I've never done, mostly things I've never thought of. Mm. This is where songwriting is so great because it's, it's a creative platform to let my imagination run wild and I'm a true explorer in that sense with songwriting so that's always been a very liberated space for me anyway but I think more in my real life I'm taking on more of the you know I'm taking I'm letting go of inhibition a lot more wow people say write what you know if someone were just to see this album and see your life they would say wow her life was rose-colored glasses and she went through that way. This is a moment in your life where you are seeing the joy. I'm celebrating the joy. Yeah, yeah. Really. Um, I've always seen the good in things. I've always been, been an optimistic person, but I'm appreciating um, being able to sing again after this, you know, very difficult operation on my throat. Mm -hmm. I'm just grateful for so many things. Mm -hmm. I have a great son. I have a happy marriage. I'm healthy. My focus is more about well-being than it's mm, ever been before. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned less about the small things. I love you it. You know, the more, the, the important things, there's a small list of really, really yeah. essential things yeah. in yeah. order to be happy. Yes, yes. It's a small list. What, are the, really. what do you need to be happy? You know, you need health. Health, you got that. Yes, yeah. you got health. I need freedom, meaning, I mean, anything creative gives me freedom. Yeah. yeah. I could live in a box and still find that freedom. Wow, that's good. I really could. I can escape with my mind. Yeah. And I'm exploring that more than I've ever, ever done before. Mm -hmm. I'm writing things that are more, more explorative, more, I wouldn't say more honest because I've always been very honest. Mm -hmm. I'm more frank than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to you be. You know, with my lyrics. Um, the songs are fun. They're bouncy. Yeah. Giddy Up is a blast. <laughs> decide that you are going to be 100% you. Yeah. I mean, this is terrifying at any age. Yeah. Um, at our age, it's maybe a little extra. Well, it was, I actually, I did a photo shoot in the nude. Mm -hmm. and in the nude. In the nude. And first time you've ever done First that? time. Are you getting, oh my gosh, <laughs> no. That was, that was a real leap of faith in my own courage. Yeah. People always thank me for um, being so courageous about yeah. talking about certain things, about sharing things. And I started to look at myself and say, you know, how courageous really am I? Wow. How much inspiration am I really giving? 
And am I really living that inspiration myself? It's been a lot of reflection. And no, listen, when I stand in front of the mirror, I don't like to stand in front of the mirror. You don't? No. Or, or, or at certain angles, or if I, if I look at myself from head to toe in the mirror, I see my faults. I'm just tired of that lack of freedom. Mm. I want to be more relaxed and comfortable in my own skin. Mm. It is what it is, and I can't change it. So it's the way I see things that has to change instead of changing who I am and what I look like. So fashion and clothing and styling and glamour, hair, makeup, all that stuff. This is something that I like to play with. And you can play with how clothing and, and hair and makeup can complement your assets or make your, your faults disappear mm -hmm, even. Mm -hmm. But when you're naked, now you're relying entirely on your own love of yourself and respect for yourself. So there's two different things. I can feel beautiful when I'm dressed up and I feel beautiful when I'm naked too. There's no way I would have said that before I took this leap of do a naked photo shoot. I don't even know where I got the courage to do it. I think I just got fed up of judging myself. Isn't that funny how we do that? Just fed up with it, yeah. you know? Why am I doing this? Yeah. So let's talk about just how you grew up. Did you know that your childhood upbringing was different, was difficult? You didn't have often enough money for food to keep the lights on, for heating. These are basic essentials that a child needs. Did you know what you were living in at the time? I certainly did from the moment I started going to school in the autumn in Canada. It's cold. You need winter clothing. Um, I would go through a whole winter with rubber boots. Mm. This is, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, your feet can freeze. You can't go out for recess with rubber boots. So I'd have to make up excuses to stay in for recess. So it was really clear early on that we weren't like the other kids, that we weren't dressing like we needed to. We weren't eating like we needed to. How kids, do you mean? All the other kids came to school with lunches, like nice lunches, you know. Even if it wasn't elaborate, even if it was just a sandwich and an apple and a drink. There'd be days when we would have nothing, and I was, I would, I would always sit there going, "Oh my gosh, is is she not going to eat her apple? Like if she would just give me that apple, you know?" And I didn't ever want to ask because then suspicion starts rising. You know, why don't you have, have your own lunch? And and when my teacher would ask that, I would say, "Oh, I forgot it," or oh, oh. "I'm not, you know, I'm not hungry. It's in my locker." Or and you learn very quickly that you are not within the norm. Was it shame? What was it? Part of it was shame, uh, and also a lot of it was to stay under the radar. Why? This is very important for kids that are neglected or abused because you, then you've got social services stepping in the door, you know, taking the kids away or getting your parents in trouble. So you were afraid of getting them in trouble? Afraid of getting them in trouble and, and afraid of being separated. I can't imagine carrying that burden as a kid. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I can't ask for help because if I ask for help, then I'm gonna get my mom and dad in trouble. So therefore, I will live this way. And it'll be my fault. And it'll be your fault if something right. goes wrong. Yes, if I say something, it'll be my fault if my parents get in trouble. It'll be my fault that, my, that the kids are separated. It'll be my fault. Did your parents bring that up to you or how did you know that? Oh, my parents made it very clear. It's a burden. It's too much for a child to have to cope with the lack of um, necessities. Mm. But then to also keep it a secret when you're going out there every day into this normalcy, into what you know is normal. Yeah, you're like, why, why don't we have that? I mean, it seems so basic. So your escape uh, was what ended up being your talent and what's just, what you, brings you here today, which is your singing. Was that how you escaped what, what seems like a very unsettling childhood? Did you just hide away and write or sing, or what did you do? Hiding away is a very good way to start this, mm -hmm. <laughs> this off because a lot of times I was hiding away from violence in our house, you know, when things got really tough financially, but it affected us in sometimes more difficult ways than others. Easiest thing for me to do was uh, mind over matter distract myself, do something else. 
so you forget that you're hungry. I would definitely take my guitar and I would go out to the bush normally. I would go out. We, we always lived somewhere remote and there was always, uh, the bush was always very close by so I could walk five, ten minutes, um, be in the middle of the bush, light a fire and play your guitar. Write, write stories. You did. Write songs. And that was, that was the greatest escape. And I got good at telling stories. I got good at escaping. I got good at creating imaginary mm -hmm. tales and stories. Mm -hmm. And I ran away in my mind. But it was your mom who recognized in you that you had a talent. Was her ultimate goal like, let me get Shania out of this? Or did she want you to sing just because she knew you would be talented and she thought this would be a good fit? My mother did definitely believe that I was talented. She was very deeply convinced that I was talented mm -hmm. beyond the norm. And, and she also realized that this could be our break, our, yes. this could break the cycle right. of our lives. I felt the pressure of that too, because yeah. I didn't want to be on stage. I hated it. I was petrified to sing in front of other people. Wow. I was great escaping off to the forest you know, off to the bush or in a, in a, closet somewhere just by myself and singing and writing. Um, it was my own special place to go to in my mind. I wasn't meant to be a performer. Wow. But she realized that the only way that I could succeed was to be performer. on the stage mm -hmm. doing it. She took you to bars and you sang and you sang in the middle of the night when a kid should be sleeping, but you sang. She took a risk by taking you out there in the night a risk not just from your father and the abuse, but just, you know, what's this doing to my child? But yet, somehow, weirdly, that ended up kind of helping you in your career. Is that fair? It's very fair to say that it helped me in my career. It, th there, wa there were no children performing in bars at that time. The kids are not allowed to be in a liquor premises. So this is why I had to go in after midnight. So you went after after the they stopped serving booze, then you could go sing. Then legally, technically, she convinced them that I could go in there then. Now everyone's drunk by then. This is right. the irony of it, right? right. Every, everyone's already drunk by midnight. So this is now my audience. I mean, my mother, of course, she would have known that I was gonna have trouble those all those times getting up for school the next morning, and I had a huge responsibility in the mornings. I was ironing my dad's shirt and his pants, getting ready for work. I was getting the kids out of bed. I had to wake him up at six o'clock. I was, I was responsible for the alarm clock and getting everybody breakfast, the kids on the bus. It was- You? Yes, it was a whole routine. And so a lot of times I missed school. I was just too exhausted or I missed my bus. I just didn't make it in time. Yeah. Did your dad think you were talented? My dad very much believed in my talent. Yeah. Talent. He loved my voice. You know, his idea of me being a singer was to get up and sing for family and friends. He was yeah. he was the much more reasonable one in that sense. Yeah. So as you're growing and your your voice is improving and you've got all this stuff going and you're I think you're 22 years old and there are days that you don't forget in your life and this was I'm sure one of yours. How did you learn that both of your parents had died in a in an accident? I was in Toronto uh, working. I was I was built working on my backup plan mm -hmm. in case I didn't make it as a singer. So I'm at a computer programming school, and I'm gigging at night. I'm doing you know I'm I'm gigging in bands at night, and I'm I'm at the school, and I get a call that my parents were killed, and my sister was had called me and told me that they that they died in a car accident, and I mean I just um, you know I fell apart totally just into shock for days and uh i just couldn't let go um of them what did you lose the day they died i lost a foundation i lost a very important foundation as rickety as it was it was still a foundation it was still a foundation that i associated with <laughs> My whole life history was there uh, with them. Well, then you had to be a mom to your siblings. How many siblings did you have? Or do you have four siblings, but three three minors? So you were becoming mom again at 22. So you yes. had your dreams, or however you were trying to cobble your life out. You're like, now I'm back, and now I'm taking care of of my. The kids. Said, the kids, that's what you called them. The How kids. much older My are? kids, I yeah. call them often. I know they're not mine, but I just do say that. 
But my my older sister was married, and she mm-hmm. had um, two children. She had a she was very very busy, um, mm-hmm. you know, with her life. My younger sister was still living at home, and my two younger brothers were still, you know, thirteen and fourteen years old. Wow. And um, I didn't, you know, we all agreed that they shouldn't be separated. But it was, you know, no other no relatives were able to take both of them in. So the only way to keep them together was for us to stay together. So you did that too. So I did that. I've heard a lot of where you've came from stories from different artists. I don't think I've ever heard one like yours. I mean, yours is, and the way you speak about it is honestly and very matter of factly. And I know that there's a lot behind it, but I feel when I, when I watch what happened to your career, it kind of makes, it all makes sense. It's like, of course you fought through, of course this was something you could do. Um, do you think once your career started rolling, did it feel like a puzzle piece that fit? Like you were now riding a wave instead of swimming upstream? I definitely lacked motivation as to be a performer, to be in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. That was always going to work against me. Uh, the drive was out of desperation. The drive was not mm-hmm. ambition. There's a, a, a big differentiation I don't know many stars, you know, that get to this point that didn't have a genuine ambition. Mm-hmm. I, my, my honest ambition, if I could have been Stevie Wonder's backup singer, that would have been my dream come true. <laughs> my dreams were different um, from where I ended up. I mm-hmm. ended up being this big performer. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I would ever have been able to imagine. But my my desperation was so strong. I knew there was nothing to go back to, especially after my parents died. Mm -hmm. There were no other options for me in life now that I had not gone to college. So by the time I did make it to Nashville, I was fearless. You were not able to intimidate me. You can say anything you want, it's okay. I'm, I'm all right. There's no way to discourage me now from getting somewhere with this. I've never heard it described as ambition versus desperation. That's a whole different animal right there. Did you ever then love performing on stage? Did it ever, when did it switch or did it? It took me a really, really long Mm -hmm. time. I started really enjoying being on stage when I started getting my voice back again. Mm -hmm. I didn't love being on stage. I was loving the people. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't see beyond my responsibility to the people. Mm, I see. But I felt like they needed so much. They needed something I couldn't give them. And I realized later, like I realize now, that all I had to do was give them what they were giving me. That's all I had to do. (laughs) But I just, it was as simple as that. And... um, Mm. I don't know why I couldn't see that earlier. I took it for granted maybe, or maybe I was just allowing my stage fright to to create so much angst that I couldn't, because I was doing something against my will almost, against my comfort zone. Right. So this is why with the naked thing, taking this photograph yeah. naked, I'm like pushing myself <laughs> yes. through this. I am, I'm uncomfortable with it, so I'm going to do it. It's like I'm going to do it till I get comfortable with I, it. I love it. That's actually a good lesson because some people think if it feels like it's against your nature, then stop. But you you kept pushing through because usually there's this fight or flight. I was only hurting myself. Yeah. You see, I was, I was the yeah. only one missing out. I would say the same thing. If it doesn't feel right, stop because it's probably hurting someone else. Yeah. It's probably not right. There's something wrong with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But... If you're missing out on something out because of fear and you're letting fear, fear get in your way, you yeah. are the only one you're hurting. Yeah. I should have been enjoying all of those years of performance. I should have been indulging in all of that exchange with the mm-hmm. audience instead of resisting it. And all of these years, I should have been enjoying myself and my own skin instead of wishing I was different. Well, what's so fun now is watching you enjoy yourself in your own skin and watching you like inspire. First of all, when Harry Styles and you were up on stage, I was like, there's this magic. And I was watching that moment and I was like, yes, there was something about that. And to watch Taylor Swift Swift on bended knee, you know, you have all of the people who are, who will be icons in the future, who are now, you know, incredible pop stars are looking at you on this huge pedestal. What, What is that like? The mutual 
respect. Mutual, yeah. It's everything. Mm. Because we, me and these kids <laughs> that are icons in their own right are the same kids that were my fans when they were four and five and six. So we are having this cyclic phenomenon in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm re, I'm being reintroduced to them as adults now. This reunion mm. of admiration, it's incredible. It's very, very surreal. I feel like your life has had so many highs and so many difficult times and you keep rolling, like you just keep rolling. So I felt like if someone had your childhood, then after that, everything should just be easy because life should never be filled with more downs after surviving what you survived. Yet, like a lot of people in this world, there are marriages that don't work and then there's a recovery from that. How did you ever come back from that? How did you rebuild just the trust or your own belief in yourself? Like is, you know, am I choosing right? I am somebody who tends to live in the future. Mm. I play my own if game. Mm. If this ever happened to me, what would I do? And it's almost like I'm always preparing myself for something bad to happen, but I don't live in mm. anxiety about it, but I do keep the glass half full. So when I lost my voice, for example, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I never am able to sing again with pleasure and for other people's pleasure, I'm going to write songs that other people sing for me. I, there's always a way to get pleasure out of the things you love, even if you can't do them the same way. Even now I can't sing the same way. I, I sing differently. I'm celebrating the fact that I can still sing period because I've been told by the doctors that just the physiology and the, the, the procedure that I had done may not last forever. So I either may have to have that operation again, which was very painful. And probably the most painful thing was not being able to speak for three weeks because <laughs> I can be quite chatty. Um, no, it, it was very painful, but so would I do it again? I don't know. Would I do it again so I, I can carry on singing? I don't know. I don't, a lot of I don't knows, but I know that I will find another way um, or a way to get satisfaction out of music and pleasure out of music. So this is the way I am about everything in life. You know, if I, even in the, on the most basic level, mm -hmm. just, you know, when life throws you lemons, make lemonade. And I really believe that. Do you rely on people? I mean, do you allow yourself to? Because once you've been let down, sometimes it's like, you know what? I'm driving this bus now. Everyone can jump on if they want, but this is, this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm the boss of me. Mm -hmm. I am not the boss of anybody else. And I cannot control how other people treat me, what they do to me, or what is in my destiny. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what God has planned for me. I accept that whatever the plan is, is what it is. But I do expect myself to manage whatever it is that comes my way. Mm -hmm. And I hold myself to that. I, I really think that we have to do that. We have to carry on. We can't give up. We can't quit. So I'm definitely not a quitter. I will find a way. I will find a solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just the creative side of me, but there is no way that I, I will never stop until I find a way mm -hmm. to get through something or to get to the other side of it. You talked about you have a beautiful, happy marriage. What makes it work? Ooh, uh, communication. He's better at it than I am. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely the person that would just rather go and play my guitar yeah. and get work through my yeah, my emotions that emotions. way, but he's very good about communicating. So he's always the one, you know, let's talk about this. And mm -hmm. um, so communication it doesn't hurt that he's, you know, drop dead gorgeous <laughs> and sexy and that, you know, so the attraction remains. I think that's very important. Yeah, you know, you need course. to be uh, in love with each other in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, but marriage is friggin' hard, yeah. you know, it, because we go through so many different phases um, as individuals and then how to work through those individual changes and be uh, respectful and empathetic to mm -hmm. each other as we're going through our own 
stuff. Shania, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't miss the Today Show every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific on our streaming channel, Today All Day. To watch, head to today.com slash all day or click the link right here.